Hey, welcome to my channel where I teach the Bible. And this is the main message of the week. It's for Friday, January 13th, I believe it is. And um, whatever it is, the next Friday. <laughs> and it's the main message of the week. And uh, this is, I'm working through, I'm doing expository teaching and preaching through First and Second Peter. And we're at First Peter 3, 18 through 22. I, this is a message I call "Win at All Costs." It's important, and uh, the First and Second Peter is stuff that people, the Christian community, doesn't look at that a lot. They need to. It is powerful, and uh, I hope you'll subscribe to my channel where I teach the Bible. Hit the bell, make comments, and help me get this out to as many people as I can. Uh, let's take a minute and pray. Father, speak to us through uh, this amazing passage of Scripture. Make Make a difference in our lives. Crawl inside us. Write your word on our heart. Make us fresh and new and different because you've spoken. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I am a native Arizonan born before 1950. Not a lot of us around, okay? There are probably a limited number of folks like me. I've, I've always been keenly aware of the USS Arizona that was bombed and sunk by the Japanese in Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. And I believe that it was pr probably about 1978 that my family and I, along with my mother and father-in-law, met my parents for a week in Hawaii. And during that trip, we visited the US Arizona, uh, USS Arizona Memorial in Pearl Harbor. And, and I'm still uh, amazed at how moving it was to stand there over where 1,100 sailors that were on the USS Arizona were, were killed that day are still entombed. They're still in the ship from December 7th, 1941. That event, going to that Arizona, the, the Arizona Memorial, took me back to that day that we were attacked by Japan and the reality that <clears throat> we had to declare war on Japan and enter World War II, which cost 400,000 American uh, servicemen their lives fighting that war. Then on December 8th, 1941, that was the day we declared war on Japan. And when you look at the video of President Roosevelt's speech, it's obvious that World War II was one of those events, and this, this is kind of how it's summarized, win at all cost. No option but to win, okay? Win at all cost. Jesus fought a war that was a win at all cost event. And, and we're going to take a close look at First Peter 3, 18 through 22. We're going to see win Christ's win at all cost event. We're going to Look at it in, in a, a few chunks. First, Christ had the win over death. Christ had the win over death. Really important. First Peter chapter 3, verse 18. It says this, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. It's a great verse, unbelievable verse. There's a lot to it. We're going to unpack it. <clears throat> Notice why Christ died. He died for sins. And he did that once and for all. Okay, he died for sins once and for all. What he paid for sin did the trick. And no more payment for sin was required. Jesus paid the price for sin. And it was done once and for all. What exactly does it mean to die for sins? Well, Romans 4.25 is clear. It kind of brings some clarity to why he died for sins. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. He was killed and died on the cross to make payment for my sin. He was killed and died on the cross to make payment for your sin. In fact, he was on what I call a rescue mission, a rescue operation on our behalf. Galatians 1.4 puts it like this. Who gave himself for our sins to rescue us 
from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. He came to rescue us from the present evil age. And it's been two, you know, 1950 or so years since that was written. And it's still a present evil age. And we still need to be rescued from it. The only way to be rescued is what Jesus paid on the cross. We live in an evil age, one where sin costs you your eternity outside the presence of God. And Jesus came to rescue us from that age. People just need to know about him. I mean, they need to know that he died for them, that he was raised from the dead and that he wants to give them eternal life if they'll trust their life to him. He was rescuing us from death for eternity by taking our death sentence and paying for it in full, paid for it completely in full. Notice that the righteous one died for those who are unrighteous. The righteous one died for those who are unrighteous. Why was it necessary to be righteous? Well, the lamb had to be sacrificed and the land that it was sacrificed had to be without blemish. That was true in the Old Testament when they offered lambs as sacrifices and that was a pre-picture of what Jesus would do. He was the lamb who had no blemish of sin. He was the perfect lamb of God. When the righteous one paid his life for the unrighteous, he, he then had the capacity to transfer his righteousness to the account of those who lack righteousness. That's you and me. That's all the rest of us. We lacked righteousness, all of humanity. Why? Because we sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. We've all fallen short of God's glory. We lack righteousness, but he gives us his when we come to him. And he had it when he paid for our sin on the cross. When we come to him in faith, his righteousness is transferred to our account. I talk about that all the time. That is critically important to understand. And then we are righteous in the presence of God. That way the righteous had to die for the unrighteous. And he did that to make us righteous in his sight. There's more. Jesus was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. His death was in the physical sphere and he was raised to life in the spiritual sphere. Don't miss this. His physical body died and his physical body was made alive. His physical body was raised from the dead. Don't ever doubt that. Don't ever question that. And he still lives in a spiritual sphere. He was put to death in the flesh, made alive in the spirit by being bodily raised from the dead. The body that died was raised from the dead, but he was made alive in the spirit which keeps on going, keep, it lasts forever. Why did Jesus die in the flesh and, and why was he raised to live in the spirit? Well, verse 18 clearly make, makes it plain that he did that so that he could bring us to God. He died and was raised from the dead so that he could bring us to God. To bring us to God carries the idea, and this is kind of a cool concept, of gaining admission to God, okay? Romans 5 verse 2 brings clarity to the idea by the use of the words in that text, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. To bring us to God is to gain access into the presence of a king and then to stand in his presence. You've gained access. You got in and you, you stand in the presence of the king and stand in his presence because you've gained access by what he paid for you on the cross when you trust him. Christ had to win over death to bring us into his presence, into the presence of the king of kings, and we get to stand there. That was so important, so important that he absolutely had to win at all costs. He had to die on a cross, pay for our sin, and be raised from the dead. Second, Christ preached the win over death. He first of all had to win over death, then he had to preach it. In 1 Peter 3, 19 and 20, it says this, through whom he also went and preached to spirits in prison who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, 
were saved through water. This is a very difficult and confusing passage, and I want to unwind it for you and make sense out of it, and it's really not that hard once we get to it. Verse 19 starts in the New International Version with the words, through whom, which is literally in which, in which. In verse 18, he talks about being put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. The, the reference is to his physical death and his resurrection from the dead, physically, without question, but in a spiritual realm. He would just keep on living in, in spiritually because he's raised from the dead, in, in which refers to his spiritual, it, his spiritual resurrected realm of life. It was in the state of the resurrection that Jesus went and preached to spirits in, pres in prison. He spiritually went and preached to spirits in prison who were held captive in chains, in bondage in prison. Many have figured that Jesus was going to preach to lost souls in a spiritual prison after the resurrection to give them a second chance. But the words do not make that clear. And the words have everything to do with what's being taught. The word for, for proclaim is the word used here, not the word evangelize, okay? I believe that if Jesus were proclaiming the gospel to the spirits held in prison, that, that the word for good news, the, the word for evangelize would be used, but it's not. That's not the word that's used. He is announcing something. He is proclaiming something to the spirits held in prison. And he's not evangelizing them. He's not trying to reach them. So what's going on here? What are we talking about? God waited patiently. We have to go back to the, uh, to the flood and Noah. God waited patiently while Noah built the ark. Now remember that Noah spent, some, sometimes people miss this, but Noah spent a hundred years building the ark in the middle of the desert, nowhere near water, okay? Much less enough water to float such a massive craft. He, he spent a hundred years built, building that, the ark, okay? While God waited on the ark to be built, not only were people disobedient, but angels and spirits, spirit beings, were disobedient too. They disobeyed God. Jude 6 the, the sixth verse in Jude refers to that, to, to that. It says, and the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their own home, these he kept in darkness bound with everlasting chains for judgment, for the judgment of the great day. He's keeping these disobedient spirits in a, in a dungeon prison to be punished at the at the last day, at the great day of judgment, the day of the Lord, when Jesus comes back. Notice that these rebellious angels are kept in darkness. They're kept in everlasting chains, waiting for, waiting for the judgment of the great day. These angels rebelled in Noah's time, and the world and the world was judged with water killing everything that lived except the eight people in the ark, okay? They, they, that was Noah's family. The, the members of Noah's family, there was eight of them in, in all. They were saved in the ark. Everybody else died. Everybody else was killed except for them and the animals in the ark. Jesus went in his resurrection form and proclaimed his victory over sin and death by dying on the cross to pray for sin and being raised from the dead to crush death forever. He went and proclaimed that he won. I won, is what he's saying to these folks. He proclaimed his win over death to those disobedient angels being held for the day of judgment. It was too late for them to be saved. He's just telling them, I won. And, and you're still in chains waiting for the day of judgment. He preached his win over death. He proclaimed that to them. That's what's being said here. Second Peter 3 verses 6 and 7, which eventually we'll get to and cover a little bit more in depth, but it links the water judgment of Noah's day to the ultimate judgment by fire at the day of the Lord. Listen to these verses. By these waters, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, 
the present heaven and earth are reserved for fire being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men, ungodly folks who won't repent like those folks being kept in the dungeon are being kept for the day of judgment and they'll be destroyed by fire. And those folks who are being held in the dungeon are going to come out and be destroyed by fire as well. Christ preaches his win over death and we win with him over death, which is going to come by fire at the judgment of the last day. We win in that. So that's what Christ is preaching. And we are on the winning side of the program of Christ because he died to pay for our sin was raised from the dead to give us life, and we've taken him into our life by faith, and we win. Third, Christ gives us the win over death. 1 Peter 3, 21 and 22, again, a confusing text. People get this all twisted around. It says this, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. The event that controls the entire passage that we looked at today, the entire passage, the event that controls that is the resurrection of Christ. His resurrection is how he brings us to God. His resurrection state is what he, what he is in and goes and preaches to the angels being held in prison. And his resurrection says, I beat death and I, and I defeated it and provided life. And his resurrection is the basis of his use of baptism symbolizing saving us. It all has to do with the resurrection of Christ. It's important to see that. It works through the whole text. The water of the flood in Noah's time symbolizes baptism as it's in water. And it is a pledge, or you could think of it as a response of a good conscience. A pledge or a response of a good conscience. Getting stuck in water doesn't save you. Okay, that does not. What is the idea of a pledge or response of a good conscience mean? What does that idea mean? Acts 2.38, remember the book we're looking at, First and Second Peter, written by Peter, Acts 2.38 is where Peter finished preaching his sermon and the people asked, this on the day of Pentecost in AD 33, the people asked, what should we do to be saved? Peter replied, this is the words of Peter, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of, of the Holy Spirit. The word repent is really important. It means to turn around, to change your mind, change the direction of your life, do an about face in life, okay? The word repent is the big deal, okay? To repent assumes that you're responding to Christ in faith and that your conscience has been moved because of the recognition of sin in your life. And you recognize that you need what Jesus paid for you. And you need to come to him in faith and be saved. So your conscience has been moved to come to Jesus in faith. When you repent and respond in faith by being immersed, you're saved. Not by the act of baptism, just not because you got stuck in water, but by the death of the burial, and the resurrection of Christ because you've responded to him in faith and you recognized that you need him. You're responding in faith. And it's ultimately the resurrection of Christ saves you because that's where life is. He paid for your sin and he gives you life through his resurrection. And then here's, here's what happens. You join Jesus in his win as he sits in heaven at the Father's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. You join him in the victory, okay? Jesus got the win at all costs, and he gives us the win at his cost, because he's the one who died for us. He died in our place on the cross and was raised from the dead, and he gives us the victory. Christ had the win over death. Christ preached the win over death. And Christ gives you and me the win over death when we come to him 
in faith. Christ's one at all cost. What if America had lost World War II? Well, we would not have the freedom to live in this country like we live today. And we'd probably all be speaking Japanese or German, not English. We had to win at all costs. Jesus had to win at all costs, or we lose for eternity, okay? But he did win, and he took no captives. He won without question. He won when he was raised from the dead, and because he lives, we live. Jesus won at all costs, and because he won, you and I win. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the win, for the fact that Jesus defeated death in his life, was raised from the dead, and he gives us the same victory, and we share in his victory with him in heavenly glory. We praise you for that, and we do it in Jesus' name. He won at all costs. Amen. Talk to you soon.